All right. Um, this section is, that is from another uh, podcast called um, Leadership Monthly. And Kevin Clower wrote this section, who is uh, an absolutely brilliant uh, emergency physician. And it's a real hodgepodge of different topics, and we're going to jump all over the place. We'll start out with some kind of more um, uh, non-clinical non stuff, but then we'll swing into some uh, really clinically relevant things that are, that are very worthwhile. The first one talks about stalking, um, which is, is kind of interesting. Uh, and they define it as repetitive and persistent attempts at unwanted communication and physical contact. Um, and they say it occurs in between 5 and 20% of the patients. I, I don't know... Um, I, I, let, I could put it this way. My own personal experience, none of our patients have ever stalked me except to, you know, panhandle when I walked out of the department. But aside from that, um, pretty much not much else. But the nurses and the, uh, the female uh, PAs, uh, MPs, and docs are very concerned about this because uh, they've been hit on by patients in the department. Uh, and I bet you everyone in here has uh, some experience with that happening in their department. And we were, um, we've had a problem with some of our younger uh, clinicians being mistaken for, for other um, uh, groups. So a lot of the times, one of the female NPs or PAs or nurses would treat somebody, and I would get a letter of complaint that they're never seen by a doctor, only a nurse saw them, because there is that, that gender bias in medicine. So we decided, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, everybody's going to have a special color scrub, and then we'll put a poster up with everybody's picture and, and the scrub they're wearing, and says, you see the... The, the blue scrubs are the docs, the black scrubs are respiratory therapy, you know, the dark blue is that type of thing. And the females got very upset about that. They said, I do not want my picture up there. And we said, why not? You're, you know, you're a prominent member of the department. They said, no, no, no. We have enough worry that these people are going to stalk us. I don't want my picture up there, my name, and how it's spelled and everything else. And we said, but, you know, it's on the discharge instructions, but they were adamant that they were very concerned about that. So we wound up just going with, you know, cartoon type, uh, colors of the scrubs and, and figures in there. Uh, and I, I guess it's, it's much more of a concern because it, it, there clearly is more of a propensity for um, the, the stalking to be male stalking female than it is the other way around. So we, we did actually uh, decide to, to not do that um, because of that concern. Anybody here ever had experience with stalkers in their department? It wasn't like the, the billing people stalking you to fill out a chart? Right. Yeah, that was one of the points we made. I, I said, you know, if I have your name, I just put it into Google, and I found a picture of every, every doc there. So I said, that, you know, having your picture in the waiting room, you know, we kind of like to brag, this is the doc who's taking care of you type of stuff, but they were, they were concerned about that. Yeah. Other people had stalkers? Yeah. Right. Yeah, they, they, he brings up the point, you know, that our hospital, in their infinite wisdom, insists on having a first name and a last name because, oh, my God, there might be more than three Chris's in the department. So every nurse has either a, a sticky or tape or something covering the, the last name. Yeah, it, it makes mo a lot of sense to only have the first name there. That kind of segues into violence. 50% um, of ED nurses experience physical or verbal violence <coughs> in a given week, which seems to, I, I, I will agree that, probably more than 50% have had um, violence in the, the course of their career or the course of the year, but 50% a week is, seems a little bit high. Um, and I guess it depends on, on how you define violence. You know, um, certainly not much physical violence, but there's a lot of verbal violence depending on where you work. Uh, and I think <clears throat> just having a confrontational nasty patient may not be defined as violent, although it's going to ruin your day. Um, they note that th you need to have a, a four-pronged response to violence, uh, to any violent event. The first is an organizational zero-tolerance approach, which I think is very reasonable. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no reason you shouldn't have that, uh, regardless of, of who the violence is, is against, male or female. Um, <coughs> uh, a lot of the male, uh, anybody here not in their entire career never been hit or, or by a patient? And I don't mean the demented swinging patient, I mean, you know, an, yeah, everybody here has, has been hit at least um, once, has been a, a subject of it, and, and you do need to have a, a zero tolerance for it. Uh, recognize escalation and intervene Im immediately. That is true. I mean, I, I can, everyone here can tell, when you're, you're in your department, you can hear when something's ramping up somewhere, whether it's, it's 
a patient who's suddenly gotten sick and they're, they're, people are running to the, to the bedside and, and moving crash carts and, and whatnot, or there's a flurry of activity, you can hear that and you respond to that. And you will, you will hear this, and most of us are very good at getting to the site where if someone's escalating and you know, at the potential of getting violent, getting into that and, and um, intervening rather quickly. As an authoritative figure, you have more of an ability to de-escalate a situation than someone who isn't the authoritative figure. So it is your responsibility to get over there. Uh, and it, obviously, it, it helps considerably to have a um, security force that, that is pretty responsive as well. A culture of reporting, no question about that. The, you know, if the more it's reported, the more you'll be able to recognize the problem and organize a formal response to it. And then the last one is to de debrief all events. I think if, if there is true, a truly a violent event, you do need to, to sit down with that individual and talk to them, whether you are the, the director of the department or you're just the physician or the PA or the MP on that day. You do have a responsibility as quickly as possible, once the situation is under control, to get that person aside into a quiet area and ask them if they're okay. You know, most of them are going to say, yeah, I'm fine, but it, it is important for them to know that you are concerned about them and to be able to do that for them. Uh, the next thing talks about changing workforce. Um, it's kind of interesting. If you survey all first-year residents, they ranked personal time and lifestyle as the most important career determinants, which is a, a dramatic change from what they wrote when they made their medical school application, um, which was, I want to save the world. Um, 80% uh, are now in large medical practices. This one I find very interesting. Um, males outnumber females for physicians over the age of 55. But in every other age group, females outnumber males, which is kind of, in, in my department, we have more female docs than we do um, male docs. Um, and I think if, as I look around the hospital over the years, I've seen that progressive change, that there are many more females in a lot of the specialties, the ones that are, the outliers are still surgery and the surgical subspecialties. You, you don't see that many uh, female orthopedic surgeons or, um, or neurosurgeons. Um, but even so, in medicine in general, you do see a, this gender shift has gone the other way. And at the same time, it's interesting, there's a large increase in the number of male nurses. Uh, so you see that that way. I, I, the other thing I find interesting is, and I don't have numbers on it, it seems that there are more females in the advanced practice providers, more female nurse practitioners, more female PAs. Um, we do, um, uh, we train PAs at our site from one of the, um, uh, actually from three of the local PA programs. And the females outnumber males easily three to one uh, in those programs for the PA students. Yeah. Yeah, he, he brings up the point um, that it's, it's not a emergency department problem, it's actually a public health problem, and he's right. I mean, but, but th that goes beyond simply medicine. You, and he, he says in the movies, you see the, the response to an unhappy individual is, is violence. I'm going to shoot you or something. But that you, you see that in um, encounters with um, accountants and everything else in the movies. You know, the, a violent response is considered acceptable in almost any social circumstance uh, in our society today. And I worked at uh, a hospital I worked at had just the nastiest, nastiest patient population when I first came out of, of um, re my residency. And I almost left medicine because they were, they were so bad. And then I wound up at the hospital I'm at now, which is just a delightful population. And they would, you know, anytime you told them, you know, your 98-year-old your grandmother died, you know, they would hit a nurse, they punched the wall, and they, their, their fallback comment was every time they were, they were confronted about this, was, oh, I was so upset. Well, being upset is not an excuse for, for violence. And the CEO of the hospital decided to start prosecuting all these people. He said, you know, that was not going to be tolerated. Being upset and getting bad news was not a reason to become violent. And so he started prosecuting all these people. Didn't change anything and he got fired, but that was beside the point. All right, um, physician burnout as a public health crisis. Um, we talked about this before, but there's an interesting, um, f a couple interesting facts in here. For every one point increase in a burnout score, so like if you're filling out the burnout score and your score is 10, and the next year they survey you and it's 12, and then the next year they survey you and the paper bursts into flames as you're filling it out, um, there is a 43% likelihood that you will leave, the doc will leave that um, uh, practice within the next 24 months. And you say, oh, okay, well that's fine, they're recognizing this isn't the place for them, they're gonna move on. 
but the cost of replacing that physician is between five hundred thousand and a million dollars. So it becomes financially really important for a group to be able to make sure that they have they don't have burnout in their um, uh, in their workforce. Quick comment: financial debt. Medical school graduates are two hundred thousand dollars in debt. That's no news to some of the people in this room. Um, there's an article that looks at professional development. And the one thing worthwhile talking about here is um, the five, way e five ways emails make you look stupid. Um, and I, I, can, I can certainly tell you I've got more than five ways to do it, but these, these guys have it. Number one is keep it short. It's an email. The, the idea is to just get the thoughts across and get out of there. You know, when I, how many people, when they open the email and it's more than like a couple little lines, just trash it? Yeah. Yeah, if you really want to hide information, put it at the bottom of a long email. You know, put a couple like, quote some paragraphs some, from Shakespeare or something in there and then put it at the bottom of it. Oh, and by the way, the, the patients um, needed their leg amputated. You know, and just hide it down there. Uh, send only to the required recipients. How many get really ticked at, you know, when somebody keeps hitting reply all, and the only thing is it's like a conversation between two of the people on the email list. So every morning it's like, you know, no, I think the blue will go better, you know, and then the next morning you get it. Blue would clash too much with the ceiling. It's like, come on, take me out of this. I don't, I don't really don't care what you have in the doctor's waiting room. All right. Clarify, pro provide enough content to let them know what it's about. How many have gotten an email and you just opened it up and it said yes? It's like, well, which email, which um, are you saying yes to? Was that yes to, you know, the three emails ago, or was that yes to this, this email? So you've got to clarify, yes, I think we should change the color of the room to blue. Um, tell them what you want. Uh, Russ Harris, who's my boss, um, taught me this, and it's not just in an email. He said, when you're dealing with consultants, tell them what you want. <laughs> so when you call ENT up, don't say, I'm calling you and I've got this patient and they've had a nosebleed and it's been intermittent and I put it back. Say to them, I have a nosebleed I can't control. I think they need the maxillary artery ligated. So you tell them what you want from them. Just kind of telling them about a case doesn't help. Just get right to the, to the point of what you're looking for. I have a nosebleed we can't control. They don't need to know how many times they've been back and forth to the ED. Just say, they need the maxillary artery ligated or whatever else you know, you're calling. You're calling with a neurosurgery, I have a subdural you need to drain. The only reason I'm calling you as a consultant is you have to do something that I can't do in the department. I've got an incomplete AB that I need you to take up for a DNA. and e you know, There's things I can't do. Once I've gotten to that point, that's why I'm calling you. Or occasionally you know, you're calling them for follow-up. You know, I did this. You know, I have a guy who amputated his fingertip. I you know, rondured back the bone. I, I pulled some skin over it. I need you to follow them but you need to tell them what you want. And the other thing is be nice, tone is important. <clears throat> um, the last thing you wanna do is write an email or sit down and read your emails after a long shift when you haven't gotten to eat and you're hungry and you're cranky because you are going to write nasty things which ultimately you're going to have to take back. And once you put it, uh, hit that send button, everybody knows you can't undo that. So make sure you reread it. I, um, on the way out here, um, I'm, I'm on a, a couple of committees, and one of the committees, this, this one person that just pushes my buttons. She's always got something new to add that's totally irrelevant and makes a whole lot of work for the committee. And she did that in one of the emails. And I was, I was you know, I had worked the night before. I was on the plane. I slept a little bit, and I'm now answering emails, which is a really stupid thing to do after I ate a little bag of pretzels. I missed the peanuts. Um, but at any rate, they, um, uh, so I wrote this really like, what the hell are you talking about? You're a pain in the ass type of email response back. Fortunately, didn't send it. Um, took another nap, got up and read it and went, nah, that wouldn't be a good idea. And wrote back and said, gee, that's a really good idea, but I don't think it's appropriate at this time type of uh, email back. So, all right. Uh, choosing wisely, only 25% of physicians are aware of the choosing wisely campaign, um, which is, I, it, if you're not familiar with it, just Google choosing wisely. And it's this list of recommendations from every different specialty on how they can be more efficient, better care. But more importantly, it lists a lot of things that you don't have to do. 
Like you shouldn't be giving antibiotics to people um, if you pack their nose for a nosebleed. You don't have to do that anymore. You know, things that we were kind of we always thought you had to do. And it's really nice to have that because you can, when you're talking to your consultants and you have a disagreement in how you should manage somebody, it's nice to be able to say, look, your society said this is how it should be done. Uh, a couple things about, and again, I think every lecture has to have something about the opioid epidemic. Um, let's see, the CDC spent $28.6 million on opioid overdose prevention. Suboxone in the ED is the most effective means to treat overdoses. Yeah, but it's also incredibly expensive and very, very, very time-consuming on the physician's part. This is not somebody you can just walk in and go, you've got a sprained ankle, it looks pretty good, you know, we're going to put this air cast on you, you can walk on it a little bit, go home. You've got to spend a lot of time with them before you can put them on it. Um, let's see. Yeah, we've kind of done that. But the, uh, it brings, also brings up the idea of addiction coaches in ED. How many have an addiction coach in your department? Anybody? Yeah, this is, an, this is someone who has been a former addict who, when you get an overdose in, goes and talks to them and tells them, you know, how they got out of the, the, um, the problem and, and, you know, recommends different uh, options for them. They are very, very, very effective. Um, I, I think they are huge, they've been a huge help in our department. And the, the one thing is they take advantage of, as, as what they, they talk about, they optimize the moment of crisis. Data is real good in alcoholism that when someone's been in an accident and they were drunk driving, that they are very receptive at that point to getting help um, or if they've done something stupid when they're, when they're intoxicated. So now they're looking at this with the opioid crisis. So if you have somebody who comes in and they either overdose or very commonly they come in, they've got an abscess that needs to be IND'd or they've got endocarditis, something like that, having these addiction coaches approach them at that point with the concept of getting rehab and whatnot seems to be a more receptive, they're more receptive to it than at other times. Um, let's see. There's a criminal charges for opioid prescribing. Uh, there are now five counts where um, physicians have been accused of second degree murder uh, for giving a quote unquote horrifying excessive number of painkillers. Uh, the scripts were for 18 100 painkillers for five patients over three years, over the three-year period. But when you do the math on that, that's 120 tablets per year. That's not an excessive amount. I, I, um, I spent 11 years working in a free clinic. We said the, the hospital had a free clinic until we lost our funding. And the ED staff would, would do it um, once a month. So every Thursday afternoon, we would go and staff it for them. Everybody would volunteer over there. And I had a lot of people, and they were really, really nice people, who had horrendous joint disease but they didn't have any money and there was no orthopod who was going to fix them, so I would, you just get them through it by giving them uh, Percocet prescriptions. And these people, every, they, they got their prescription for the month and they would um, come back. They, they never lost it. The dog never ate their prescription. Uh, they knew I worked in the emergency department. They never came to the emergency department asking for more meds because they had lost it. These people functioned very well on long-term um, opioid prescriptions and it worked out just fine. But in order to do that, so if you gave someone Two Percocet every eight hours, six hours a day. That was six pills a day times 30 days a month. You were writing for 180 tablets of Percocet a month. Uh, and the first time I did this, like, you know, I'm used to writing for 12 and 180, my God. But then you realize this is what it took for that person to be able to do. And they were able to work and everything else. And I wrote, so saying that someone wrote 120 tablets a year is not a ridiculous amount. For somebody who you know has a chronic painful disease, this is a uh, this is what they're going to need. However, if you're writing for um, 100 or 1,800 painkillers, that's probably a little excessive over the course of a month. Um, eh, we'll skip the, the one. Georgia has an amnesty law uh, about the um, uh, if you give someone Narcan and you screw it up and you squirt it in their ear instead of their nose or something, you're, you're held harmless. Uh, a couple of clinical topics. This is kind of fun. Um, without looking at it, any guesses on what the most expensive condition to treat in the United States is? No fair cheating. Any guesses? What's that? What's that? Heart transplant? That, okay. Diabetes? Diabetes? Okay. Actually, it's septicemia. Uh, it accounted for $23.7 billion 
which is 6.2% of the total cost for all hospitalizations in 2013. I would not have guessed that. Number two is even another one I wouldn't have guessed, osteoarthritis, 16.5 billion, 4.3%. Now that's probably because of all the, the, um, the joints, um, the total joints and stuff. Uh, newborn infant care at 13.3 billion, 3.5%, that I would buy. You wind up in the NICU for a month, you know, you, you've got a, a 25 weeker that's in the NICU for um, a month and a half, two months, that's really expensive. Um, Complications of device implants or grafts at 12.4%, and that was 3.3, and then acute MIs uh, in at 3.2%. So it is, it is kind of interesting, you know, that, that septicemia would be number one. I think part of that is, and we're going to talk about that in a second, um, more things are being lumped into sepsis. You know, in the past, you just had osteomyelitis. Now you have osteomyelitis and sepsis. Um, Sepsis Care Improvement Initiative. In 2014, all hospitals are required to have a sepsis protocol. Why would they want the hospitals to have it? Because it's real expensive. So if you can do a better job of managing sepsis, you will cut down the cost of it. So it's not that these people are, are, very, are really concerned about patient outcomes. They're concerned about patient costs. So that's why the big initiative is for the sepsis. Um, for instance, adult protocols increased from 73% in quarter two of 2014 to 84% in quarter three of 2016. Okay, so everybody's got a sepsis protocol. How many people uh, have the sepsis police come and beat them up if they don't complete the bundle on somebody? Yeah, we, we've all had it. It's, and it's a little lady comes in, looks a little dry, and then in, an hour or two later, they spike a temperature, but nobody tells you about it. And, you know, you missed one point on the bundle, you didn't do your reevaluation at three hours after the fluid, you know, and they come down and, and you know, they, they put you in, they take you to the cafeteria and they put you in the blocks and your head's in the blocks and your head's sticking out of it and everybody makes fun of you. Um, there's an improvement mortality for adults from 30% down to 25%. Well, you look at that and you go, I don't think these bundles make that much of a difference. How come there's so much better care? And the answer to that is just what we had said. Everything is now sepsis. Nobody dies of pneumonia anymore. Everybody comes in and dies of sepsis. So all that happened is you shifted a lot of stuff that was going to do perfectly fine into the sepsis uh, definition, and so now you have these better outcomes. Um, interestingly enough, though, pediatric mortality has gone up, 6.8% up to 10.5%, uh, which I, I find kind of interesting because I, I don't have an explanation for that. Here's some uh, infections you do not want to get. These are a list of things um, that the World Health Organization lists as the most dangerous bacteria. Uh, and these are all based on their drug resistance. The priority one are the critical ones. And these are what you would ex expect to see. Uh, Actinobacter, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Enterobacter, uh, the carbapenin resistant, the ESBL producing ones. Those are the ones that we are getting to the point where we can't treat you. If you get an, a bad infection with this, the best we're going to give you is supportive care, and you're going to ha just have to hope that your immune system can rally uh, for you. Um, because it, this, it, now we don't see it that much in the ED, but certainly in the ICU, these, these bugs are really uh, a difficult problem. The, pr the high priorities are Enterobactus um, staph aureus. Well, we know that with the, the, the MRSA. Uh, Helicobacter pylori. I never realized that Helicobacter, there was a clarithromycin-resistant strain of Helicobacter. Um, and so that's, that's a problem now for all you people with ulcers. Um, Camphlobacter, Salmonella, and uh, Neisseria. There's the the uh, Salmonella and the Camphlobacter are all fluoroquinolone-resistant, so that's the worry about them. The Neisseria gonorrhea is cephalosporin-resistant and fluoroquinolone-resistant. And there was just an article uh, that there was some guy in London, I don't know why he was in London, but he had been in Southeast Asia, who was now infected with a gonorrhea strain that was resistant to everything. No matter what they tested it for, it was resistant to it. Um, so, you know, that now if you look for the advantages of social media, you really want to get that guy's name. Because, uh, you know, if, if you're on one of the dating sites and his name comes up, you want to swipe left on that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they did? Yeah. They, they, yeah, they okay, so this guy says they used erdipenem and they did cure him. I still wouldn't date him. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, 
And then the medium ones are strep pneumonia. There's some um, penicillin uh, resistance growing there, H flu, ampicillin resistant. That's been around forever. I mean, when I was a medical student, there was amp ampicillin resistant. How, how many remember when you had, if you had a kid with um, um, uh, meningitis, you had to give him or, um, chloramphenicol? Anybody remember those days? Yeah, a couple people do. Yeah, the, the young guys in the room can't even spell chloramphenicol. Um, and there's some um, fluoroquinolone resistant Shigella out there. What else did, did they say here in this stuff? This is actually kind of neat because jump all over the place. Some population health um, things in here. I, I do like population health. Um, trauma is the number one cause of pediatric death. 57% of children live within 30 miles of a pediatric trauma center, which makes sense. You put the trauma centers in highly urban area, highly populated areas, and there's decreased mortality at pediatric trauma centers. The, the problem, I have a little trouble with the trauma center concept. I do believe you know, having immediate access to, to an OR and the resources involved there is very, very valuable. Um, the problem is when you talk to people, how often do they really need to take somebody immediately, immediately to the OR in this day and age? And um, Chris and I were talking last night that a lot of trauma care has really evolved to good emergency department care, good ICU care, and they're not going to the OR. So you can kind of skip that piece where, where the surgeons are there. And this, the idea of having a surgeon at present for every trauma resuscitation really has gone by the wayside if you've got a good emergency department there and then good interventional radiology and a, an ICU can take them to. There is an interesting ar article on the, on the ICU care. And what they said is you need to make predictions early in the ICU care of what is futile. And I think that is really important. How many, how many of us have seen that patient that, you know, the postcode, we got them back, and they're kind of, we know they're brain dead. They go up to the ICU, they stay there for a, a while as well, and a lot of resources, you know, dedicated to them, but in the end, they, they, they wind up dying. What these people say is that docs are very bad at predicting uh, death. And a positive likelihood ratio of 5.9, at worst predicting long-term morbidity, the positive likelihood ratio is 2.3. Uh, so the, the concept being that we're, whereas we have protocols now and algorithms for what to do with a stroke, what to do with an MI, what to do with sepsis, we need to develop those same protocols for 24 hours after the resuscitation. I don't think you should ever you know, terminate things in the ED once you get the, you know, the return of spontaneous circulation. But within 24 hours, the ICU should have enough data points that they can put together to predict what's going to happen to this patient long term. Now, the downside to that is everybody always yeah, has the story of, you know, the 40-year-old the drowning who everybody thought was never going to wake up, who woke up and became a professional soccer player, you know, a month later. Those, those things exist. But if you're looking at population health, you should be able to put together an algorithm that says when you have these circ meet these circumstances, the odds of you surviving are, are low enough that we should probably begin to ratchet back uh, all the uh, resources um, dedicated to you. Uh, finally, there's a thing about everybody's worst nightmare, which is early death after ED discharge. I mean, that is absolutely the worst way to begin a shift. It's like when you walk in and they go, hey, Al, you remember that guy you sent home? It's like there's nothing good coming out of the rest of that sentence. Uh, you know, he came back with a big check for you and went to buy you a car? Nah, it's not going to be the way it ends. Um, the uh, yeah, risk management wants to talk to you about them. Um, excluding patients from palliative care and whatnot, here's what they found. 0.12% die within seven days. Oh, that seemed a little high. Uh, I mean, 1% would mean one every 100 patients you discharge died. So this would be one out of every 1,000 patients you discharge died. Mm, I don't, that, that, thing, that seems it's a little bit high. Mean age was 69, which makes sense. You're, you're, it's going to happen to somebody younger than somebody older. You're going to be more careful with sending those people home. Causes of death, uh, atherosclerotic heart disease, 13.6%. That would probably make the most sense. MI, 10%. COPD, 9%, which I think is a... COPD is one of those ones where you have wiggle room. You send them home, they're going to have enough wiggle room that they can come back. Um, they're not the ones that just go over and keel over dead. It's a, they got more short of breath and came back. And then 2.3% uh, were overdoses. That, that, uh, that's understandable. I can, I can buy that. So, um, Some interesting stuff in this one um, from uh, Kevin Clower. And then ED Leadership Monthly is, is a podcast. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about where you can get all this stuff and, and where the um, 
uh, all those abstracts in your articles originated from.